Greetings, this is I, Tantus Mariman Dracovic, your lord and emperor here at the Dracovan Empire, and welcome. Yes, today we are diving into yet another faction within the world of darkness. Vampire the Masquerade calls to us once again, and I'm going to be introducing you to the Sabbat. Last time we talked about a faction, we talked about the Camarilla, which is one of the two major factions. This is another major faction, and granted, these aren't the only two major factions that do exist within the world of, uh, in, of Vampire the Masquerade, and certainly within the world of Darkness, but when we're focusing on Vampire, uh, there are plenty of other minor factions, other big factions that work in the shadows and stuff, and you'll see there's connections between some of these factions that start to occur a lot more. Certainly the connections between the Camarilla and the Sabbat are they hate the fuck out of each other and try to murder each other a lot. But that's changed in Vampire 5th Edition a little bit. So let's talk about the books you might want to check out as I throw myself over here. You might want to check out uh, if you are interested in diving into this. Uh, so if we're talking older edition books, uh, we want to start with uh, the, the Guide to the Sabbat uh, is one of the first ones I would say too if you're talking about older editions. Um, I think this is, let me just make sure to get the exact edition it is for you. I have to go click on the, uh, this is 99, um, so I think this is a revised edition. Um, from there, we also have the Storyteller's Handbook uh, to the Sabbat. So that was the first one, it was a revised edition. Um, this is right after the uh, so this this is also I think revised edition oh no this is earlier edition uh, so this is I'm trying to check the years yep so this is one of the two very early books so this is original first edition um, a book that you can check out. Um, and then uh, the Player's Guide to the Sabbat is the other first edition book. That was the first one to come out. So those two are the main first edition books. That's the um, second for revised edition books. And the other book that just came out, which is the newer one, which is the Sabbat the Black Hand. Um, if you are playing and you're specifically using um, something like, I'll, I'll use a little bit better image a little bit bigger there about that now you're capturing the wrong page I love how you switch things there we go I was looking up the year for it there's the book a little bit better mm-hmm uh, I'm using uh, a combination of the player's guide to the bot which I actually own I have the um, guide to the bot as a PDF and the uh, White Wolf Wikipedia as my, um, as I used to use the Wikipedia pages as a outline more than anything for giving over information. The thing is, I'm also using the Wikipedia when it comes to stuff from the 5th edition book, as I do not own the 5th edition book. I haven't really supported 5th edition, um, but 5th edition does have some good information, which I'm going to talk about here because they have done some interesting things I do like with the lore, just I don't like their uh, mechanics a lot more than I like. But I do dislike some things in the lore. I also dislike the mechanics a lot. So depending on your time period, you could basically use any of these combinations of book, and they do tend to counteract each other to a little bit of a degree. And that's an important thing to note about these different books. They do correct or counteract each other. The newest ones tend to be the most correct ones for official lore, but Play it as you are, you know. Use it as you wish, honestly. The amount of lore and how you use the lore is completely up to you. Uh, let's do this one because it's a little bit more uh, captured there. Anyway, let's talk about the Sabbat then. The thing about the Sabbat is it's unfortunately for them not as well organized as the Camarilla. The Camarilla kind of have this idealism that they don't necessarily reject the idea of the antediluvians and Cain. They kind of put things in perspective. 
To the Camarilla, Cain is a myth. The Antediluvians are real, but they could be lying. To the Sabbat, both are completely true. And that's a difference between them. You're already getting it. So yes, the Antediluvians are kind of believed either way, but the Antediluvians kind of disappear, you know, kind of thing like that. But the idealism of Cain and the exact history of uh, vampires, the Sabbat are dive deep into that kind of thing. While you only have a couple of kind of supported nodists for the Tamarilla, It's a reason why their group is also known as the Sword of Cain. Because there is this deep belief that they are the army that will destroy the Antidiluvians under Cain uh, once the basically vampire apocalypse Gehenna arrives. Um, or the, the kind of like end of everything that Gehenna is. Gehenna is a topic that I've probably hit on here and there throughout videos. I would definitely think that maybe diving into it on its own might be a thing someday in the future. So, who are the members of it? When was it founded? All these different things. We can mention a lot of these things, but they have shifted a lot. Um, the true founding of the Sabbat was around 1493, and the original members were a group of two clans and anti-tribute. The two clans are the La Sombra and the Semiche originally uh, sided with it, and many of them still are in it today, though the exodus of the La Sombra to the Camarilla was something we were talking about, and we will mention that was a very modern 5th edition thing. But there also was the Anti-Tribute. Anti-Tribute basically being members of uh, pretty much any clan um, that is against the loyalty or the the main sect of that clan um you get you originally got anti-tribute from both the um Semiche and the sombra in the camarilla now the the sombra anti-tribute are with the normal ones and the remaining la sombra it sort of like splits the thing there it's when you're not with your main clan when you separate it out many of them end up in the Sabbat, basically. Um, I mean, technically speaking, the La Sombra that joined with the Camarilla kind of is anti-tribute, but kind of not. It's a, it was a very heavy exodus. Anyway. So there's things to talk about with it. Um, and also the uh, Panders slash Cadiff uh, are a member of the Sabbat. So, it was also originally a, uh, they found their bastion in Mexico City, which they've lost, and they're led by a regent. Let's talk about the history of the Sabbat, though, um, because that's an important one to dive into. And this is the original um, symbol for the Sabbat group. This is what you would have seen in anything uh, from 1st edition to 2nd edition. Um, it was in revised in 5th in fifth edition that it was altered and beyond. Uh, so V20 is in the middle there. So again, I mentioned that it was 1493 that they were sort of founded. They were the remnants of one of the Anarch revol revolts that were happening. And the direction that came about was... It was the Convention of Roses that really drove them home. The Convention of Roses, or sorry, the Convention of Thorns. Uh, I'm saying it wrong there. The Convention of Thorns, which founded the Camarilla, which really drove home their creation. It was pretty much in response to that. These Anarch revolts were basically attempts to get rid of the control um, of the elders, in a way. And yes, there have been other Anarch revolts since the Camarilla and Sabbat form, uh, but there's actually been two more, technically. Um, but certainly, the first one, which was a big battle and led to failure, resulted in this bunch of forms I talked about the Camarilla and them forming together and trying to get some kind of order 
with Vampire Society. And so two clans, which were highly involved in the revolt, the Samiche and the Sombra, both which I may note had destroyed their antediluvians, but they hadn't, which is an entire thing to talk about, but their physical forms were both technically dead. The Sombra became a horrible shadow monster, Samiche became a flesh monster that existed within all of his chin. kin. There, a lot of bad things happened there. Don't worry about it. Well, that's to talk about, which I already have in places. Anyway, um, the Samiche hated the Tremere, who were being supported by the Camarilla, and had a, like didn't want to submit their, submit their lands to her. Um, they also had their own philosophies, metamorphism, which was very against humanity, which was the code of the Camarilla, the uh, path that the Camarilla took. And so the Samiche, while they weren't as heavily involved with the Anarch Revolt, they still were kind of, there was this two-prong prong front of hey, the Camarilla are supporting this upstart group because the Tremere weren't that old. And also, they want us to follow this other path which is completely against our philosophy. And then, of course, the Sombra, who had pretty much been a main driving force of the, revol uh, of the re revolt. So, uh, there is the, a quote from the um, La Sombra that came to the Convention of Thorns. Um... And it was, I came to negotiate, not to surrender. Uh, because they wanted a negotiation, but the idea became, because the Convention of Thorns, granted the Sombra were on the Anarch Revolt side. They wanted that negotiation on surrender, and they didn't really get it. So, these two clans met together on Majorica, had their own negotiations. Um, several others from amongst the Anarchs joined them who kind of review, refused to join with the other groups of their main clans. Um, they also, there was those that wanted to escape the practice of the blood bond that a lot of elders had been using. Um, like there was a Malca the Malkovian, uh, Vanis Testa, the Tremere, Gortrix, and the Ventru Dominique uh, Torloin. Uh, these elders basically didn't want anything to do with their... Um, th these... They were technically um, elders, but they wanted to get rid of the practice that the, even the Methuselahs and older generations were using to control even them. Um, so they didn't want to submit to the Camarilla, and then this basically was the formation of the Sabbat. Um, they, the Sabbat in this early age would drive superstitions of mortals with very callous behavior, d displays of inhumanity. Um, it, it's basically... They were leftovers, mostly at this time, from the Anarch result, revolt, revolt, which didn't want to submit to this new Camarilla. And it took uh, this kind of spread and uh, the group uniting these remnants into what becomes the Sabbat. And that's what they did. They united the remnants of the, the Anarch Revolt and their kind of building faction. And their philosophy was war against the Antideluvians and the tyranny of their minions. Pretty simple as that. You know, it's basically murder the camera. <laughs> Like it was like they saw the Camarilla as the minions of the Antediluvians. I mean, the, there were elders in the Camarilla that knew the Antediluvians and, you know, could be like, oh, hey, there's like, you know, uh, I, I, I met Malkov the other day, you know? Uh, there are those that, like, you know, could say stuff like that. So, the Camarilla wasn't much that old, though there were older vampires in it, before this anti group to the Sabbat came. Um,. The Inquisition at the time came and claimed a lot of victims of uh, the um, Europeans' canines. Uh, sands, or basic marks in the sands, were drawn throughout Europe as they were battled with each other. Um, Camarilla was able to hold considerable power over a lot of European cities. Uh, the thing is, 
they were well established. Even though the Camarilla was newer, a lot of the vampires that were members of it had establishments and power bases in there. So the Sabbat were just kind of driven into a defensive position. Um, it was in the Black Monastery in Switzerland, though, that they formalized the modern Pass of Enlightenment um, in 1666, which basically, in the Dark Ages versions, they were roads, they became paths, they became obsolete. These were the new ways of philosophies that you could follow that would be very different than this path of humanity and would be options for you and your own philosophies. Um, the thing is also, those that were in control of the Sabbat did realize that there were protests against, you know, being a tool of the antediluvian, similar to the Camarilla, secrecy is still a decent thing. Um, I think the idea for them is they don't want to fall into uh, frenzy. The last frenzy, of course, when you drop to, a, which in the normal thing is when you drop to a humanity of zero and become permanently under the control of be the beast, Wassail. Um, it's still good to resist Wassail and the beast, uh, the monster inside you, to not to trolley drop. So that's why a lot of the paths do not fall that far. Um, so you don't necessarily need to pretend to be human. Just don't fall into your control of the frenzy and stuff like that. That's kind of what they said there. They're, they made stipulations which didn't necessarily fit along the side of the Camarilla, but kind of did. They're less like, you know, if we just indulge everything and kind of just throw ourselves out there, we're just going to continue to fall into a uh, monsterdom and not have control over ourselves. And that's just as bad. Let's not do that. Spain had been controlled by the Sombra mostly. And some uh, territories in Eastern Europe and Scandinavia had been controlled by the Smiche. So, these areas had been power bastions for the Sabbat in Europe. They remained those. What happened, though, is when the New World was discovered, a lot of packs, especially those that weren't in those areas, traveled there. These new existing colonies that were growing up were a great place to kind of go to and find a power vacuum. There weren't vampires in the New World. And amidst the things like the revolutionary radical movements, the violence that were happening in that area, Spot was made it made it very easy for Spot to just kind of blend in. And um, they did fight things that were there, though. Um, there were those vampires that controlled the Aztecs. Uh, the monster, uh, who, I'm gonna butcher this name here. Just give me a second here. Um, who was basically a member of the Bali, a vampire Melusa slash demon. Uh, Huitzuyolo uh, Um, I butchered that. Don't, you know. And, and of course, the Lupines, the Garu. Uh, you know, fighting against them. Um, so, Zabat found preva uh, prevalence and power in the Americas, but they weren't alone traveling there. There were disenfranchised Camarilla, basically younger generations that couldn't carve out their own legacies in Europe because they didn't have space to, places where, like, European princes just had this iron hold over areas, so where do they go? The New World is a great place to go. And, you know, that's another thing that happens, though, is the problem. Their presence there and the lack of organization with these packs in America and struggle between La Sombra and Samiche for control of the Sabbat happened with, resulted in the first Sabbat uh, Civil War. Um, it's not, the, they've had a number of these. And this first one here um, actually 
it was immediately after the American Revolution, and it was younger Le Sombre and Sabat in the New World basically com competed with each other. Um, so the European Sabat, uh, the, the members, really weren't competing too much. Um, the initial attack was the, the Semiche against La Sombra holdings that cover the Shea Rebellion, and there wasn't any supervision from the elders in Europe that were still around. The thing is, this strife allowed the Camarilla to move into the East Coast very e easily. Um, a lot of power base that the Sabat had been working for over the next 30 years ended. Camarilla and many of the other enemies they had made in the New World undone. And some enemies from the Old World, too. Um, the Purchase Pact was what ended this first civil war in um, September 19th of 1803. Uh, as a small joke there, they were talking like pirates. Oop, oop, talk like Pirate Day, September 19th. Uh-huh. Uh, thank you for that joke. I have inserted it now. Uh, levity has been inserted. Um... Basically, all internal grievances were uh, kind of void. Uh, conflict was forbade between sect members. You weren't supposed to be having open war with your fellows, or you'd be hunted down and diabolized by your fellow Sabbat. Sabbat. Uh, the Code of Milan uh, became a much better, bigger, um, important thing. A, a code that exists. It's the Code of Combat, con Conduct for Sabbat Vampires. Um, which we will talk about. Um, so. Yep. But that was the end of the first Sabat, uh, Civil War. There will be more to come. <sighs> so. Camarilla now has a huge foothold in the New World, the Sabat you know, ha has still had some strength, you know, things were okay for a while, but the cooler heads that came after the war did not stay, unfortunately. And so, we get the second Sabat Civil War. It's just that even with the purchase pack, kind of this deal, there was still animosity rumbling beneath, beneath it. Um, yeah. It occurred in Mexico and Canada from 1863 to 1933. So this was a 70-year civil war. Um, it began with the assassination of the Regent Gorchist. Regent being the controlling power in the the Sabbat, who was a, uh, by a ravenous anti-tribu in Mexico City, uh, just prior to the French capturing Mexico City in 1863. Um, it reverberated with those rivalries between uh, Los Sombra and Semiche that had been kind of still simmering there after the last civil war. Um, so, because they honestly blamed each other for Hey, we lost a lot of power. The Camarilla's in the New World now, too. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. They began fighting again. It began and was primarily in Mexico. Um, and that power base was nearly torn apart because these two swept up not only themselves, but many clans, factions, and cults that they could strong arm to each of their sides. Various regions emerged throughout the world, even the uh, as the Sabat uh, south of the U.S. border toward each other with bloody relish. They just murder the crap out of each other constantly. Um, a number of factors interceded in the, to cause the conflict to eventually end. Um, the eventual catalyst to end the war was the Shepherds of Cain, which were a very old Sabat uh, coven in the Western Hemisphere, uh, the oldest in North uh, America, um, kind of as a group, 
using their position to bring together a comp what they called the Conference of Cain in 1910. Uh, it brought together many members of rival factions and together under basically an unspoken tr uh, treaty at that point in time. Um, many of these pacts then turned to Melinda Gabrith, um, who had made Mexico City a neutral ground um, during this time, basically. This made Melinia, uh, who was a Toreador anti-tribute, pretty good as a regent. One of the reasons that she became a regent. Um, and basically, she also protected any kind of battles that happened in Mexico City during like the Mexican Revolution. During that time, the daytime battles. She protected those during the crossfire. Um, disease, warfare had colored, culled a lot of herds the Sabbat had depended on. Fighting cooled. Uh, Gabarith basically summoned envoys to Mexico City at this point in time of all the highest ranking Sabbat. So we already have this unspoken treaty that kind of cold sings a little bit. Melenia in her neutral things calling together some of the more powerful members of the Sabbat. And basically, with the, with the Shepherds of the Black Hand, several powerful packs, she used this point in time and her neutrality to declare herself regent ended the hostilities and the conflict officially though ended on December 21st 1933. So the Conference of Cain hadn't caused everything to end but it did kind of cool things down a lot. So we'd still 23 years of maybe much more of a colder war rather than a hotter war. Still some hot flare-ups here and there. And basically the Code of Milan then became the true sect practice. Um... And Gabriel just had everything in. <sighs> yeah. It was um, a tough time. But the Sabat managed to do their best. Um, you know, it was not the end of Sabat's infighting, though, is the problem. So, after this, the Sabat had managed to keep control of some major U.S. cities, even with the internal war. Philadelphia remained under their dominance. Um, some other places did, too. Um, the areas in Europe, though, did remain untouched by these overseas un uh, upheavals, though. So, that's an important thing. They still had control in Spain and some Eastern European uh, things. Their, their old world sex still didn't get involved in this. Because, again, like, they were kind of separate. I mean, La Sombra, Spain, Ceniche, and Eastern Europe, they were separate from each other pretty well, so they didn't really get involved with each other. This is when things began to develop along two different lines. We had another change in it. Those that were the kindred of the city, those that lived in cities, and those that were the nomadic ones. The nomadic packs uh, had fled their cities after the defeats at the hand of the Camarilla or other Sabbat. So we have these bunch of nomadic Sabbat now that were created because, hey, our war allowed the Cam Camarilla to come in and kick us out, or, hey, our war between each other caused us to get kicked out. So the city of Kindred had these permanent havens. They resembled a little bit more of their Camarilla counterparts. Um, inserting themselves in the local infrastructure while the nomadic ones just traveled all the, all across the country in the new world not really being in a place too long and basically going by a lot of tenants that would have been from the ancient Anarchs from during the Anarch Revolution the first one um, then we get to the final Sabat Civil War the third one well technically not the final one. There is a fourth one. But the one of the final ones before we get into modern nights. Fourth ones in the modern times. So it occurred in the later half of 1957 and lasted only for 100 days. So in comparison to the previous two Sabat Civil Wars, they were this one was very short. I mean, like, the last one lasted like 70 years. Uh, it, so the Bruja Anti-Tribute in New York basically attempted a 
Goku against La Sombra and Samichi that have been dominating the sect since inception. Um, nearly about two-thirds of the resident Sabat in New York were killed in the conflict, and this was just shy of open warfare. So they still maintained it, still secretly, and the two sides settled the matter in diplomacy. Um, it was this time that the La Sombra and Samichi did recognize the anti-tribute compatriots as equal with the sect and agreed to recognize the clan lists as their own unique distinction, so the minority clans would have greater voices in the politics of the Sabat. Um, there were some non caddis that saw this as a ploy to water down the anti tribute's voice by adding in a growing bloodline to the Sabat's place. So basically, they took in the caitiff, the clan list, also, very heavily, and basically, like, you also can get political voice. And they're like, yay! And the anti tribute were like, wait a second. But still, um, the clan list then kind of fought against sustained beliefs, superstitions, archaic vampires, arguing that clan doesn't have really a meaning to a vampire's potential, and overcoming a lot of biases and bigger bigotry that did earn themselves a place in, the, in this entire place. So basically, they became the Panders rather than Cadiff under Joseph Pander. Um, under the name of Joseph Pander. Um, he, had, he, he had killed the first La Sombra in the Third Sabbat Civil War. So. <sighs> anyway. Now. We get into the modern knights. Yeah. we've. This is all just some deep storyline. And this is the... Uh, there is a similar symbol to this that is the uh, revised edition. This is the fifth edition symbol for the Sabbat. Welcome. All right. Let's talk about modern times from the 90s on. So, and we'll talk about the fifth edition font timeline, how it says. So, the Sabbat took a lot of direct offense against the Camarilla. But there were still internal crises that were going on. They mean they managed to gain control of Atlanta and Washington D.C. from the Camarilla, but New York City and Milan had been lost to the Camarilla. Uh, the Tremere anti-tribute had been completely, pretty much destroyed. If you see my Tremere video, you can see about that. And the attacks uh, against the Mexican Sabat by unknown beings. Uh, only being dampened by the arrival of some new allies, the Salubri Anti-Tribute, and of course, the Harbinger of Skulls, um, who are a group I've talked about in the past, but are also a rare bloodline. Those, these two bloodlines kind of joined the Sabbat. Both of them wanted to extract vengeance against their an enemies, basically. So the Black Hand... Uh, a member of the Sabbat, uh, which I'll talk about in a second here, was shaken by infiltrators of the Talmakera. The Talmakera. The true Black Hand. Uh, two of their seraphs vanished, and several Asimites abandoned the sect to return to the Alamut under the new leadership, basically for the entire thing that happened with the Asimites. Um, and then there was also tensions between Saba elders in the Old World and those of the New Worlds, the regent was slain, although th this was only known by uh, the one who basically impersonated her for a, quite a while, uh, Zachary Skorsky, uh, until the uh, until that shroud was revealed. The Black Hand, just as noting it, is a sect within a sect. It's the Sabat military. We'll we'll dive into that a little bit. So, before we talk about the V5 timeline, we'll mention the Fourth Sabbat War. Yeah, there's a lot of these war, civil war. So, following the explosion of the Grand Hotel uh, Caluda de Mexico, uh, where Beckett, the vampire archaeologist, was supposed to meet with the regent in disguise, 
uh, our good friend Zachary, there was a bloody interceding war that happened after that. Um, three of the four black hands of the uh, sub, uh, black, th three of the four seraphs of the black hand vanished. Numerous vampires were drawn into it. Um, the black hand kind of got into it. Uh, Sabat across the globe worked themselves into a frenzy, kind of certain that this was a cause of Gehenna. Uh, you know, nothing really happened too much. Uh, there was a lot of things that talked about Gehenna being a thing. So some questioned Gehenna. There was those that wanted to go to the Anarchs. Um, some fleeing the Sabbat during this time. And so this there's a five-year period kind of when this happened that a bunch of Sabbat joined the uh, Anarchs. And um, the idea of the Gehenna Crusade, which we'll talk about, kind of functions from this entire thing here and its origins. So, the V5 timeline. Second wave situation has started. The Gehenna Crusade has started. It originally started in the Middle East, but has become worldwide. So the Sabbat have basically given up on control of the cities they had, and have now flocked to war zones everywhere. Most of these domains are still out of bounds to the Camarilla, um, for a variety of reasons. But the Gehenna War between the Camarilla and Sabat is kind of being waged in disputed regions. The Middle East tends to be one of their core areas, but again, it is a global effect. Um, and this is kind of a preemptive crusade against what they, they believe are the coming antediluvians. So the Camarilla has been joined with this for a number of reasons. Well, first off, the Masquerade, they would preserve it. You know, vampires going to open war, not great. And also, there are plenty of Methuselah and Topor that, honestly, they would not want the, the Sabbat war pro parties to basically eliminate. Um, Chicago Folios is a 5th edition book, which uh, you can check out. Um, which talks about some of this information about the basically what kind of degradation and horrors they're kind of doing currently. Um, it's such a good point in time to look into that. Those Sombra, though, have kind of defected, though. Um, the Sabbat might do something in the in retaliation. Uh, so. That's a thing that's been happening. Yeah. Um, the beckoning, which has been going on, which is the call to uh, the Middle East and this war, you know, and what's, or what's going on there. The Sabbat have been kind of going towards it rather than resisting it, as most kindred do. Um, so, yeah. And yes, the Sabbat, the Black Handbook, gets into a lot of what's going on currently with this, and certainly with this Gehenna War. Um, that's going on. Uh, yeah. So, the idea of the Gehenna War, just to briefly go over that, is that it starts in Middle East Africa, the cradles of civilization, becomes, it became global. Elder kindred around the world are basically being compelled to travel and to this region and enjoying the conflict. Uh, the Sabbat, as crusaders and a sword, saw this as a call for war and basically have unmasked gone to their... They want to kill the Antediluvians. Um, there was a fateful encounter that was presumed as a somber Antediluvian during the conflict that caused the Amici Noctis. Basically, the Friends of the Night, uh, a.k.a. Uh, the... La Sombra governing body as a clan to be like, you know, this crusade that we're on feels very suicide mission currently. It's really benefiting the Antidiluvians and Methuselah right now. So, 
though they don't want to necessarily be pawns of both of those, they do see merit in allying themselves with a different group in this case. Hence why they migrated to Camarilla. And this is the beginning of the, this change here. And yes, the scope of the battle has been expanded across the books. The original core book just said Middle East. Uh, the Camarilla book then also said it was in Europe and stuff too. And the black, this current uh, Sabat Black Hand book has mentioned that it becomes global. Okay. That's the history of the, uh, the Sabat. We've dove deep into this here. But we have more to talk about still. Let's move on and talk about some of the culture of the Sabat. Because that's an important thing to mention a lot too. What is, well now we know their history, now we know some of their ideas, but we have to talk about them a little bit. So the official color is purple. The symbol I showed is this official symbol, but there are dozens, hundreds of signs, passwords, gestures that allow you to identify one Sabbat from another, basically. You know, in practice, you as a Sabbat can recognize enough of these signs and enough of the rites and gatherings and stuff that you can identify another one. Typically, only a bishop or archbishop, I'll talk about the ranks, um, can identify any vampire in their domain as Sabbat or non-Sabbat. Um, and in the case of Nomadic Pack, it kind of becomes a chore. You know, it's like, oh, the Nomads, they're here now. Great. Um... And again, each pack of Sabbat can have their own symbol, gesture, or way of identifying themselves. And those packs that go undercover, it becomes even more obscure. Ugh. Um, younger Sabbat, particularly those of La Sombra, like to wear things like crucifix on their persons, necklaces, earrings, tattoos. It's the irony of being damned, but have a symbol of salvation on uh, salvation on them is kind of to their amusement. Um, especially if the bearer is the packed priest. Again, another rank. Uh, older La Sombra, kind of seeing this as kind of irritating or blasphemous, um, even if they do wear a cross themselves. Sometimes they do. Uh, I guess their, argu their argument is that the, these younger do not believe in their own damnation or God's immortal power over their souls. Uh, if you saw my La Sombra video, you know a lot of them have a very religious tent to them still left over in their beliefs. And this is where a lot of younger basically deal with the trappings of the older, you know. It's the Sabbat's mission to tear down the Camarilla in the Masquerade and rule hope a human openly. Um, See so the elders who lived through the Inquisition don't answer that. And the um, bishops even don't come up with a response. So that's the kind of idea. Is The younger believe it's like, we're going to get rid of the Camarilla, the masquerade, rule humans openly, you know. It's like, we can't do that until we get rid of both of these things. And the, and the elders who happen to go through the Inquisition are like, yes and no. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if you've overgone, so this kind of comes down to then, um, a typical attitude is that being a true Sabbat is a matter of importance and distinction. A true Sabbat being one that's over, undergone the creation rites, um, it's basically a more important level uh, the creation rights I will uh, talk about in a minute. So we'll just say that they are a thing. Um, you don't want anybody kind of going over and claiming rights or privileges in Sabbat without proving themselves first. Things like the creation rights are a way of helping prove yourself. Um, the pack structure of the sect, though, kind of makes them very gangy feudal warlords um and the completing of initiation rites are a way of making themselves so special within this gang and stuff so that's the importance of these rites that they have especially things like the creation rites 
it's a matter of me within a a my gang in my pack you know in my war band of sabbat being more important than the others in there um if you go higher up in sabbat you get symbols a lot less and the us against the world kind of disappears a little pack and becomes a little bit more me against the world uh a kind of the thing is, if you're surviving for a long time in a in the, the, the Sabbat with the way that they work, you gotta kind of find a way to look out for yourself. To kind of s claw together every advantage you have, or little bits of profit, or little bit of thing that protects you against whoever might stab you in the back, or find your weakness and take advantage of it, or anything like that. So... They also don't really have a rigid hierarchy to promote or control the ambition of Sabbat vampires. Your rank, your title, it's however strong you are to take it. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog culture that the two top clans, the Semiche and the Sombra, encourage. Uh, the smartest, strongest, most capable lead the Sabbat. And the rest are just fodder for their betters. The only time this kind of can be suspended is during a crusade. And even then, there's plenty of reckless people. Wild hunts tend to be a way of weeding out the slow and weak from Sabbat's ranks. Ah. Who are they? So. Oh, another thing we'll talk about is the uh, Valdery. So countering the Anarch Anarch atmosphere is the Valdery. Um, there's only a few elders who are members of the same pack and occasionally work together and share Valdery. Younger vampires who are living and fighting together as one unit develop a feast protection of one another. Um, if you can't rely on your pack mates, loyalty in question, you know being together. Uh, the Valdry is a blood rite practiced by them. It breaks existing blood bonds and unites the pack members together. Um, it was created in the er, Anarch Revol 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 Um So this is a bit... It's basically a way to break the blood bond to elders. Um, they use the Capula's Fire Flower to perform the ritual of Lombard's Ruthen as blood catalysts. Each member of a pack drips a small amount of Vitae into a cup. Um, it's shared amongst the pack. It creates a communal weaker blood bond, a blood bond, basically, a vinculum. Um, so it, that's the idea of it. It's, it breaks a previous blood bond and creates this kind of lighter blood bond between the pack. That's what the... Um... And again, this is a very important thing because the way that the Sabbat works... This little blood bond that keeps packs together as tight units. With everything that happens, they probably erode, kill each other otherwise. This helps keep things in line with them. Something fell down. Let's talk about the rites. Of course, we will start with uh, one of the previous mentioned rites, the creation rites. It's performed by a Sabbat priest, can only be revoked by a regent, a prisky, or grand inquisitor. Uh, if you've not undergone it, you are a false Sabbat. Uh, you need to be a, to, uh, which, you know, I talked about a true Sabbat. Um, it's either you were a true Sabbat and had your status revoked to become a false one, or you just didn't do the creation rites yet. Uh, you're basically uninitiated in a way. Um, in general speaking, vampires talk about it. Sabbat are created on the fly, recruits being drained, fed, bashed from the heads of the shovel, buried, left to call the right to the surface uh, in a starved frenzy. It's not really the case. The method is actually the creation right. The shovel head method, the one described, is the one in times of conflict. Uh, that method is collecting a bunch of victims, embracing them with the tiniest quantity of blood possible, bashing them in and uh, burning them in a mass grave. Um, and because it's the strongest survival, the fittest, you know, they're in a mass grave, they'll 
claw themselves out of the expanse of uh, the expense of the weaker ones there, um, and it strips them of a lot of humanity. You know, which is something that they don't really want. Uh, vampires created this day do not actually receive the creation rights. They're not really vampires. They're just legions to throw into battle. Um, it's kind of this weird idea that you're not actually a vampire in their mind until you receive the creation rights. You know, in a way. It's a passage from going from true, false sabbat to true sabbat. Um, and uh, it's an initiation thing. So, uh, that's the basic way of describing it. Um, anyway. Other rites, though, that do exist, we can talk about those. So, bonds of loyalty and fraternity are very important to Sabbat, and these rites, beyond what I've already talked about, exist to put the part of this. So there are a lot of more rituals than just these. They all reinforce the pack, sect, sect sol solidarity, and structure. Uh, they observe the same 13 anodictorous rites uh, and the ignoblest rites vary in greater number. Um, the Anadolictus rites are basically um, sorry. Uh, I'll list them off here. I'm not going to go into depth about them. The Binding, the Blood Bath, uh, the Blood Feast, the Creation Rites, the Festive Dello Enesto, the Fire Dance, the Games of Industry, Manimacy, Pala Grande, Sermons of Cain, Valdreri, War Priority, Wild Hunt. The Noblest Rites are basically everything that's not these. They are practice and ex exercise are a lot different. They go from pack to pack. So there are lesser rites that are there too. Um, uh, yes. I could go into depth about all of these rites, but that would be probably time consuming and I don't want to use the entire time here. That might be a thing for the future. Or if you want to, you can look up these various rites. But know that these 13 rites are like the 13 commandments of the Sabbat. They're in fact treated very similar to that. They've got this theological idea that these are the commandments we kind of follow. And you can see some of the ones I talked about, the creation rites, Valderi, those are listed here. Those are the two that I kind of wanted to hit on from this entire list. Uh, I guess Wild Hunt's also the one I want to mention too. Um, which is hunting down a traitor and, you know, murdering the crap out of them. Um, that's basically an easy way of saying a wild hunt, you know. Uh, the war party, which th it's about thriving on diabry. Um, but, you know, we can all go into depths about these. But they are the more important of the rituals you can dive into. Anyway, um, the packs will observe the, uh, Octutorious rites at the most common times um, before they do things like sieges, bringing new members in the packs, there's a good rate of them. Uh, the uh, ignobilis rites kind of occur whenever, usually when they're appropriate. Um, so, like, we've got the rites that we have at very common times, and those that are just, yeah, you know, this is a great time for this ritual right now. Um, The thing is, most rites exalt the vampire state and striving for perfecting it, so these rites oftentimes are very cruel to both mortals and kindred alike. And they oftentimes have shamanistic or kuldonic origins, a lot of these rites. Um, kuldonic sorcery being a old practice sorcery from the Dark Ages in Eastern Europe. So that is a mention there. Hey, that big image disappeared. <clears throat> Let's talk about the Sabbat organization. So they, again, they're not really tightly organized the way you would think an army of Cain would be. 
they're t organized, though, more than the Camarilla in a way. So, a Sabat vampire sire is chider as usual, and is just as picky as any other vampire about it. Though the mass embrace I talked about can happen for shock troops, um, the shoveled heads, as I mentioned, they don't survive usually the first few weeks, and uh, again, they're false sabbat. And any that do prove themselves can go and undergo, undergo the creation rites and become true sabbats. You have to prove yourself to it during this time period. Um, those that are specifically embraced, though, kind of receive your instructions from your sire much directly, much earlier. You're getting to become a true sabbat quicker. You don't have to go through the shitter. The pack, which is usually three to ten vampires that are kind of in that mutual blood bond together. They have two main people in charge of them. The Ductus, uh, who is the pack's war leader, and the priest, who is the pack, um, remember, reminds the pack its responsibilities to Cain. So basically it's the idea you have one person that's the person that's actually in charge, and one that is the person that then uh, goes by, like, here's the stuff that, you know, we have to do to maintain ourselves as Sabbat and Warriors of Cain. Um, packs will have communal havens, and um, there really isn't a need for privacy because of the rejection of mortal ideas and the loyalties of the uh, vinicule. So they just live together. Um, so the, hier the hierarchical titles that they get kind of mock the titles of the Catholic Church. So we start with the political hierarchy. We've talked about the false sabbat at the bottom, true sabbat, ductus, pack priest. Pack priest is kind of above ductus in a way. They're kind of at evil level. But now we kind of get into higher levels. You have uh, bishops who oversee multiple packs and may have a kind of specific portfolio on those packs that they oversee. Above them are archbishops who basically are a f very similar to princes of a city. Above archbishops are cardinals who oversee a geographical regions. So that would be like Ca Canada, the Eastern Seaboard, and who comprise a, a cons consistatory. Um, who then com comprise the consistatory. The governing body then that selects a regent. Uh, advising the regents the consistatory, archbishops, uh, or other leaders are the uh, prescidi. Um, the consistatory, of course, being the council of... Um, Sabat, um, currently the consistory is 13 cardinals, a number of Prisci. Uh, the Prisci is like an, uh, an authority that is kind of informal. Um, effectively, they are the regents, like a board of directors, the regent chooses the Prisci. Uh, like the primogen of a Camarilla city. The primogen being those that advise the prince. It's very similar, but it's to the regent who's in control of the entire thing. Um, so, yeah. So, the Prisky do tend to be elders that are respected, uh, either elders or other respected Saba that are basically brought in here as advisors or, or kind of judicial roles, you know. So, that's the organization. We have our packs under the Ductus Pack Priest with their true sabbat, false sabbat. We've got the bishops above them who kind of like, you know, keep a number of different similar packs in line. The archbishop controlling a city, uh, the cardinals, and uh, kind of uh, controlling a big region. And then the cardinals um, are members of the consistory along with Perskriski, who are just important individuals who have earned the respect of a lot of other Sabbat and stuff like that, or are very elders, and under an elected region. That's the basic organization of the Sabbat. <sighs> oh, brain farted there. So, we do have two other groups. 
Higher ranks is about that enforce the, their will through agency. And depending on your rank, you either have the title Templar or Paladin. Templars are appointed by a bishop or uh, sometimes a leader of the group. And they are basically their bodyguards slash enforcers. Um, they're always selected because of their ability to, well, kill, fight, battle. Templars cannot become members of the Black Hand. I'll talk about that. Paladins are, on the other hand, are hand-picked members of the Templars. And um, they're for protecting things like cardinals. And, you know, sometimes archbishops will have paladins, um, but effectively highest ranking members will have these. Mo they're selected from amongst the Templars as more elite, these paladins. Um, again, they're also forbidden from being membership, and most paladins pretend to be Templars uh, for the sake of anonymity. Um, so, yeah. All right. So that is, of course, the main government and the main organization of the Sabbat. And there is a, a degree of self-selection in this entire thing. You know, it's sort of like you've earned the right to become this. But they are recognized, though, too. Um, there are formal rights for recognizing a bishop or higher rank. But really, any Sabbat can claim a title and try to defend it. You just have to be able to do that. Um, the thing is, though, the more higher the rank you claim, the more, re more likely you have a gruesome end. Um, things like the Prisky are only selected by other Prisky. So actually, that's... Oh, sorry, that's how they're selected. A Prisky will elect another one. Um, miss, missed that one there. Um, so there is, like power basis here and b bombing to other greater powers the pack is the kind of like important things it's just that elders will then begin to live and work without their pack makes more likely as you become older and more experienced and once you get to those top levels you really can't tell much of a difference between the camera and sabat elders other than how, you know, they fight in the trenches and honestly some minor differences in belief systems. Uh, yep. Let's talk about factions. Boom. The various factions of the Sabbat. Uh, is that one bigger? Yeah, that was better. The Sabbat is highly fractious. There's a lot of personal freedom above everything else, and this chaos, this fractionness, even can happen among packs. So you will get people supporting different factions, even amongst other packs. So you might be loyal to your pack, but you have disagreements politically? <laughs> it's almost like a political kind of thing for most of these things here. And we'll be getting into some of the uh, things like that. Um, so, who are these factions? And let's talk about them a little bit. First, we have uh, the Loyalists. These would be on the left side of the political spectrum. Spectrum. Um, the Loyalists see themselves as the heirs to the Anarchs, which technically the Sabbat kind of was. Um, they believe that loyalty to the Sabbat is to follow the original principles of the Anarch movement from the first Anarch Rebellion. And that all vampires are free and ultimately responsible for their own actions. They oppose the Code of Milan and the Purchase Pact. Um, again, the, the, the Code of Milan, which I've mentioned, which is a code of conduct for Sabbat, it's another one that um, I could dive deep into. I'll just go over some basics of it so you know right now, just to add it in here. It's three sections, the Tower of Duty, Tower of Honor, Tower of Courage. Um... The Tower of Duty 
Details of appropriate behavior for a knight via simple maxims, clear examples of proper actions, Tower of Honor, uh, fully details the past spiritual tendance, uh, tendance to the six different parables, and uh, the Tower of Courage, a dense alteric tale of a knight travails a shadow quest. Effectively, it's kind of like just a way to do things. And um, it pushes the Regency and the Black Hand as strong members of it. There's a lot more to it that you can dive into. And again, similar to the rights, you can dive into it on your own if you want to learn a bit more. But maybe that might be a thing to talk about in the future. Anyway, after that, there's the Moderates. They're not as radical as the Loyalists. They see modern Sabbat as a as clogged with rules and regulations that are contract to the spirit of the ritual Anarch result. Uh, they support the Purchase Pact, but they oppose several tenets in the Code of Milan. So they're like, the Purchase Pact, which was kind of like put in place in order to kind of like, it's again, it's a non aggression treaty that established a number of boundaries and rules to prevent infighting. They support that, but they're like, you know, there's some things in the Code of Milan we really should get rid of. The status quo group is um, literally seeks to keep things the way they are and work with the current system. Uh, they believe all, allowing all members to lose reign will compromise security and secrecy of the sect, and they support both of them. The orthodoxy Sabbat advocate the strengthening of religious aspects in the higher echelons of the Sabbat, believing it would to do otherwise would invite divine error. Ire. Did I say error? Ire. Um... They have a no-quarters attitude towards heretics, and uh, as well as reinforcing the position of pack priests over ductuses. Remember I said pack priests and ductuses were kind of on a similar level? They want the pack priests to be more important. Um, the religious center to be more the religious center to be more important than the leader position. And then you have the ultra-conservatives, the far right wing of the sect. Uh, they believe that Gehenna is just around the corner and that the sect must be ready for war. In their eyes, even the revised Code of Milan does not go far enough to unite the sect because it has been revised. Uh, so, some other groups, of course, are the old clan Samiche. They join the Sabbat mainly to have peace and not be bothered by these fledgling moments, the pander movements, uh, which support any faction uh, is another group. Uh, to help increase their uh, legitimacy. Uh, the Order of St. Bla uh, Blaze, uh, spelled with an S instead of a Z, and an I. Blase? Maybe Blase. It, you know, I'm bad at these words. They're a clerical order within the Catholic Church that serves as the Sabbat's li liaison to the Catholic cl clergy. Um, established in the 14th century. Mm. So, yes. It's one of the reasons, I guess, that maybe the Sabbat don't care about the Second Inquisition as much. They had an in already. So, now let's talk about the two big organizations within the Sabbat. Mm. Of course, I mentioned the Black Hand. There's also the Sabbat Inquisition. So the Inquisition investigates the signs of Sabbat for demon worship and apostasy. The Black Hand is the militant sect, kind of semi-independent from the Sabbat that pertains it. Let's talk about the in Inquisition. Because they, the Sabbat have their own one. They're inspired by the immortal ones. Infernalists are their primary targets. Uh, dark the uh, thaumaturgy, those that practice it. Uh, they also tar uh, target heretics, uh, apologists for or agents of the Camarilla or the Antediluvians, those who deny Cain, preach against Nodism. Uh, cults of Lilith are a popular target for them. Um, There are those within the group that do have a network of Bahari that follow the path of, Li of Lilith. It was founded in 1804 by Priscus Gustav uh, Malenhos. 
when he encountered a group of demon worshippers in Europe and basically didn't want them to infiltrate the Sabak. Um, so, by the end of the century, though, the Inquisition, uh, now led by Saur Jin, became a political tool. It couldn't enforce the Code of Milan anymore. So they had some power beforehand. They lost a lot of it. Um, they reformed the Inquisition in 1911 uh, when Julian of Avignor um, met with Alfred Berenzini and basically the reform only can happen if Jean and her inner circle were eliminated. In 1919, Jean was destroyed by the Black Hand forces led by Julian and the Inquisition fell into ruin. Julian uh, stood down as a, a dominion and reestablished the Inquisition in 1924. So the Inquisition we know now is a different one. The old one was just murder. Um, he recognized that the Black Hand was being manipulated by an outside group, and that's why he established it. A.K.A. the true Black Hand, Tal Makira. Um, Julian didn't know the identity of this. He became the first Canaanite to hold the title of Grand Inquisitor and retained it for many uh, decades, despite many assassination attempts, um, plenty of which were attempted by the Tal Mahira, uh, who just did not want him around. Eventually, Julian was killed by his own sire under the order of the True Hand in 1970, um, though Julian did slay the traitor before he died. It wasn't until 1973 that a successor emerged, emerged in Maria uh, Sedoza, who became the second Grand Inquisitor. So, individual Inquisitors kind of hold a level of authority equivalent to a Templar. Uh, they're almost seen as a subset of Templars in a way because of that. Um, because of Julian's results, there are a lot of rivalries with the Black Hand and vice versa. You know, so... Templars are formally banned from joining memberships in the Black Hand, um, including because Inquisitors are Templars, basically, and vice versa. And only two Canites have ever joined both group, have vanished without trace before one could... Co Either one could complete their initiation. So Grand Inquisitor, is a, who's appointed by the regent, may I know, is, le leads them. So the Grand Inquisitor is appointed by someone and supervised by a separate envoy who's bound to the regent. So the regent knows what the Inquisition is doing, the Sabbat Inquisition. Watchers, who are retired judges, uh, oversee field agents from strongholds known as Santo Oficio, the Holy Office. A hidden location uh, which is core to the set and they catalog every trial and investigation of the Inquisition. The acting ranks are the Judge Inquisitors and Knight Inquisitors um, who usually organize in nomadic packs with up to five members. The team is too, usually led by a senior judge who takes the position of Ductus for the pack. Now our good friend the Black Hand, a subdivision of the Sabbat military Basically, the Sabbat's military, as you can say. <sighs> they are technically loyal to the Sabbat abo uh, above all else. The Asimite tribute were a major part of them, um, along with many more militant vampires from other clans. They aren't in packs of their own. They are still members of normal Sabbat packs. So that's kind of a thing about them. They they don't form their own packs. They're still members of normal packs. It's just they also then become members of the Black Hand. They do form temporary packs as Black Hand operatives. And they're more war bands, though. And they're referred to as uh, Kamut. To distinguish it from your ordinary Sabbat plaques, uh, packs. It could be as small as two or three members. As large as a dozen. Depending on the mission. Most are temporary, assembled by a dominion uh, for a particular mission, and they're dissolved when the mission is complete. It's a special military that the Sabbat musters at times of needs, 
and you are particularly skilled in a way of war to be a member of the Hand. When you're a member of the Hand, you can select Sawbot vampires that are offered. Uh, you select Sawbot members that are offered the chance to join it. You see candidates and your others around you. Uh, they go through a series of trials, tests of cunning, willpower, physical prowess, martial prowess, and if you pass those, you become a member of the Black Hand. And you're instructed in the way that things work. Anyway. <sighs> yes. Tal Mahira has been infiltrating the Black Hand. They start with this idea of the Lost Tribe and, you know, it, 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 it's part of the Sabbat basically because this Black Hand group resonated with the Sabbat originally in the early Sabbat and joined them r shortly after the Convention of Thorns basically becoming a subcult within them that originally acted mainly as assassins so that's basically the Black Hand they were this kind of group that existed on their own um, and joined with the Sabbat early on. They were separate from clans at the time, so they've evolved since then with their new organization of new members and stuff, but that was their core. And, yes, the Talmaki Ra spread their corruption. Half of the Seraphim, which are the uh, generals of the Black Hand, have forsaken their original mission for the goal of the true Black Hand. Uh... Uh, which is serving the Antideluvian during Gehenna um, pro uh, to uh, propagate them by sacrificing their ill-begotten brethren. Yeah. The two of the Seraphim had vanished after the first spirit nuke hit their hidden headquarters in the Shadowlands. The a spirit nuke hit the, sh the hidden headquarters of the true Black Hand of Shadowlands that led to the Sixth Maelstrom. So, that's when basically the infiltration was kind of revealed a little bit. Um, you know, they're still there, though. They never really have members when we're talking about organization. It has never had elaborate organizational. It's flexible. Um, and that flexibility has been their strength. They've agents distributed throughout the Sabbat as order members of ordinary packs and are called into active duty when needed. It, they call about a commute, do their thing, and then they return to their original packs. There are extraordinary situations where more than one commute can be assembled, complex missions, uh, those that are, um, like the Sabbat drive up the East Coast. Um, but not many times does that happen. There are only two inter... inter uh, uh, there are only two tiers that stand between the common Black Hand members and the Council of Seraphim. The, the Dominions and the Ductus of their Kamuts, uh, if they're on active assignment, or the local Watch Commander, if they're not. So... Dominions is a permanent rank between the Seraph and the Black Hand. They're basically senior officers, mission commanders who oversee small operations of a single uh, come up to a, a full-fledged siege. Uh, they're proven leaders that basically are given this position. Um, they don't partic serve a particular Seraph. Watch commanders are field marshals, basically. Uh, they're, they're leaders in a certain area. Um, again, these are two of the major groups there. And then there's a council of four powerful who rule the Black Hand, uh, the Seraphs. They're generals. They serve directly under the Regency, at least in name. Uh, you know, at least in name. Um, so the first Seraph is the highest ranking member of the group, and the other three are basically their advisors. All Black Hand members are immune to vin vinculum. Pact blood bond. 
um, when it comes to direct orders given to them by the seraphim. Uh, the members of the hand only answer the seraphim when conducting hand business. Other than that, the Victualum and Sabbat Codes of Justice affect them just like the rest. The leaders of Sabbat aren't really happy about that because they could wipe the in entire out of them in a night. Uh, you know, so it's sort of like, hmm, that seems not great for us. Um, other groups, other members, <laughs> English, 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 English. Other ranks that do exist under the major ranks there, um, which we can mention, they're just lower ranks. Um, the emissaries are black hand operatives that act as the subsex representatives and spies when dealing with common sabbat, eyes, ears, and hands of the black hand. The shikar um, is basically the assassins of the black hand. Yeah. Uh, it can be also from younger operatives of the Black Hand sometimes that exist, but technically, Assassin is the best way. Uh, removers are brute strengths, muscles of the Black Hand. Um, if you need something that requires basically brute violence, you get a remover. Uh, rookies are those that have not participated in, in at least three missions of the Black Hand. And cadets are trainees who haven't had full memberships. They do have a number of secret practices. Uh, Death's Head. Um, if you're assassinated by the Black Hand, they'll slice off the face and front part of the skull. Uh, made into masks, used in the Dance Macabre, paid and decorated in some way. The Dance Macabre ritual to dress as the dead perform ritualistic dance similar to the Sabbat's dance macabre with deaf hands. Yeah. Their sacrificial offerings. Uh, they sacrifice living beings respect to Cain and the Antediluvians. Um, young kindred or ghouls are lesser sacrifices, you know. There's also vision seekings, ingesting LSD laced blood, the blood hunt, a loath of uh, an oath of loyalty, spiritual uh, hierophutics. And the tress of verification. I butchered a lot of these. But that's our good old friend, the Black Hand. And of course, the, um, Inquis the Sabbat Inquisition. And finally, let's bring up some heresies. Just to finish up today. So freedom is a big thing in the Sabbat. But there are false teachings. The Path of Lilith, of course, is a false teaching the path of enlightenment to preach subservience to the fathers <sighs> the path of Typhon or the path of blood are others like that perhaps you've fallen into infernalism so like the path of evil desolations or maybe you've misplaced ambition and curiosity well don't worry the inquisition works hard to bring your heretics to justice. But the widespread nature of nomadic pacts makes complete eradication of this heretic so difficult. So you might harbor heretics without knowing it. They might be spreading their teachings to unsuspected shovel heads. Because these threaten the faith that is the Sabbat. They're dealt with. But that's the Sabbat. They are a group which, honestly, certainly, you could very easily play a Sabbat. The Sabbat are a group that plenty of people play in either new and old. And yeah, there is some darker tones to them, certainly. And a very different way of working. They're much more inhuman. But similar to the Camarilla, it's still an interesting experience. Personally, I prefer Camarilla-based stories or more independent-based stories, just from my way of telling Vampire the Masquerade and World of Darkness stories. But 
doesn't mean I couldn't come up with a very interesting Sabat storyline and run it. Their group in 5th edition I find very interesting as it is this kind of worldwide battle. And certainly it opens up for more play in different ways. And I'm interested in how 5th edition reflects their own abilities since Frenzy and the Beast aren't as shunned as they should be in the Sabbat. Why bother preventing it? I'm just interested. It's one of those reasons that sometimes, just with how they've been established, I'm always interested how it interacts with the philosophies and ways of a lot of these established things that feel like they don't fit with 5th edition's rule set as well. But regardless, though, whether or not you're using 5th edition, 20th anniversary, or an older edition of rules, the Sabbat oftentimes are seen as maybe villainous. But they really aren't. But sometimes it's good to be the bad guy, too. Especially if that's kind of the way you see them. It's interesting to see that they had this core of something. A core of difference, of change, of freedom at what they began with. And what they are now, is it really that? Or is it something different? This villainous arc is often seen because of, perhaps, taking freedoms too far or maybe just because of their disregard for humanity and its idealisms mainly because the Camarilla supports that we choose to be less human just because the other guy wants to be more human I like the Sabbat as a group, as a tool, and as a concept a lot. And I hope my speaking here has made you want to check out some of the books and maybe dive a little deeper into the Sabbat. Because certainly things like their rights, their codes, and things like that could be looked into a lot more deeper if you want to. And if you are planning either to run a Sabbat game, or maybe you're going to join one. You might want to know what those 12 rights are. You might want to know a little bit more about the Black Hand or the Inquisitors, especially because maybe you can find yourself a member of one of those. But anyway, thank you for joining today. I talk about Tabletop every Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays live on twitch.tv slash the Empire if you want to check me out doing this live. If you want to um, check it out later on, it goes up on YouTube. Great ways to support me. A follow on Twitch. A subscription on YouTube. Liking or commenting on this video. Making some comments that are related to... Have you had a Sabbat game? Have you played as one? What are your encounters you've had with one? I'm curious as to what various players and storytellers have had experience and how you've used or encountered the Sabbat. I've always used them as antagonists. Other tabletops related stuff, of course, I have live plays like Buccaneers Shackled Sea or others that happen um, and discussing tabletop every Saturday evening. So I thank all of you out there for joining once more. I hope you remember to also uh, follow me on Twitter and Discord for my musings and schedule. And of course, Enjoy your time in the world of darkness. We will be returning here. And until the next time out there, I bid you all a wonderful